Broadcasting Network, a divine voice out of Africa. Remember to like, to subscribe and to click the bell. So, um, just, you know, just to give a little more background, but I praise God because I, I learned, and, and I, in the podcast we did today, I, this is literally what we talked about. I had no idea I was going to talk about this when I came this weekend, uh, but now this is already the second time. Uh, but we learned, you know, um, when you look at it, that like Daniel or the three Hebrew boys, sometimes it's in the fire that you meet Christ. Amen. You see, if, you could, if the three Hebrew boys had figured out another way around the fiery furnace, they would have also escaped a chance to meet the pre-incarnate Christ. Amen. And some of you are going through some stuff. You're here this weekend really going through some stuff. You can't say out loud what you're going through. I want you to understand that you need not shy away from the fire. Amen. You need not run from the storm. If Jesus is in the vessel, you can smile at the storm. Amen. And the problem with the storm for most of us isn't the storm. It is the lack of Christ in the vessel. Like the disciples on the ship on the lake when the storm hit, how afraid they were. Master, carest thou not that we perish? The ship literally could not sink with Christ on it. Just like Lazarus could not die if Jesus was in the house, so he waited two days to go to allow him to die so that he could raise him up and make the point once and for all that he is the Christ. So understand that as long as Jesus is in the vessel, you can smile at the storm. It changes your whole outlook on life. When you ask the tough question, God, I'm going through this terrible time. What is it you're trying to teach me? What is it that I'm supposed to learn? What, is it, what character defect do you want to uh, burn off from, um, on me as you pass me through the fire of trial? And when you start to take that stance, your trials become more like a workout than, uh, than like a death sentence. And just like you go to the gym and get uncomfortable, to get stronger, you go through trial, and in its discomfort, we grow spiritually stronger. All right. We do have a sermon we have to do here, don't we? All right. All right. And, and, I, and I, so our, 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 our scripture reading is taken from 2 Peter. Um, chapter 1 says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Here's where it gets important. For if God spared not the angels... That sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that should after live ungodly. Our message this Sabbath evening is entitled, When God Spared Not. When God Spared Not. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, I ask once again that you make me just a nail on the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. But upon that nail, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard tonight. Instead, Father... Let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. All right, so let's go. Genesis chapter 18, verse 16. The Bible says, And the men arose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? Abraham had such a relationship with God that before God would move on something, God actually contemplated whether or not he should share it with Abraham. 
Let me tell you something. You are such a friend of God that God is not going to do anything in these last days that he has not already shared with you in his word. Ah, that's why we study prophecy. Prophecy is God's um, showing his friendship toward us, just as he showed it toward Abraham. Verse 18, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. So God said, listen, I don't know if I I need to tell Abraham what I'm about to do, but the cry of these cities, the wickedness of these cities has reached up to heaven. And because of it, I've got to go down here and check this thing out myself. And here again in the Old Testament is um, an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ. The Bible says in verse 22, and the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now, Abraham had a vested interest in what was going on because his nephew had uh, chosen the better land. He took the land that faced towards the cities, and because probably some urban sprawl happened, before long, Lot was inside the, 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 the confines of the city. And so Abraham knew he had blood in the city. I would imagine he probably had Thanksgiving dinner at Lot's house sometimes. Or some equivalent. He had visited him at least. So he asked, would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And then he starts to do this numbers game that is almost unique and found almost nowhere else in Scripture anything like this. He says in verse 24, peradventure, there be 50 righteous within the city. Will you also destroy and spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? And Abraham said, listen, if, we, if uh, the city is thousands of people, but if there's just 50 of them that are righteous, would you, would you save the place? The question you have to ask yourself then, and it is a quintessential question to Christianity, and that is, who are the righteous? Genesis 15 and verse 5 gives a one aspect of this. There are many others, but this is the, the one I want to highlight for our talk tonight. Genesis 15, 5, uh, God speaking to Abraham again um, several chapters earlier, and he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven. And tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. So on a nice clear night like tonight, God had Abraham look up, see all the stars and say, can you see them? The number of stars, he said, remember, this is before pollution. uh, So you could really see far and the bright lights of the cities. He said, that's what your seed is going to be like. Verse 6, and he believed in the Lord, and watch this church, and he counted it to him for what? For righteousness. What, did Abraham do anything? In fact, the story of Abraham is literally antithetical to calling him righteousness for a couple more decades. He doesn't trust God. His wife doesn't trust God. He actually marries his wife's handmaid and has a child he should never have had. Yet the Bible says that up front, his account was preloaded with righteousness. Here's what the Bible says, Romans 4, 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for what? Did you get that? Abraham doesn't really exercise righteous behavior until he's taking his son, Isaac, up to the mountain, uh, about to put him to death, or, or at least carrying, out the, uh, all the way, carrying him up all the way to the mountain as if he's going to put him to death. That is when his righteousness shines through appropriately. But it is years after God speaks to him and shows him the stars. Galatians 3.6 
even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. James 2 and verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Look at the last part there. And he was called the friend of God. Ah. Righteousness is something you cannot earn. Abraham, in fact, went backwards before he ever actually began to move forward. Righteousness is imputed. This is why we, as Protestants, believe in the concept of righteousness by faith. His righteousness was imputed before his behavior caught up. Ah, that liberates somebody. Because what folk believe is that in order for them to be right to come to God, they've got to begin to live right first. I would submit to you that, in fact, you'll never live right if you don't come to God first. We'll talk about that a bit more tomorrow as well. Back to the story, Genesis 18. That be far from thee to do after this manner. So he's pleading with God. Now, we'll go through this part quick because I love how he does it. He just slides all the way down from 50 really fast. Um, uh, like he's haggling in a market. Uh, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and the, that the righteous shall be, should be as the wicked. That be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham was so close with God. Look, he's like, listen, you're the judge of all the world, man. You can't just be killing righteous people with the wicked people. And the Lord said, if I find 50 righteous within the city, I will spare all the place for their sakes. Just 50. Abraham remembers those visits to Sodom, and he says, you know what? Mm, there's probably not 50 people in that city. He says, uh, we, we might want to do some subtraction here. And Abraham answered and said, behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, uh, and I'm dust and ashes, because he realized I'm wrong. Like, I'm challenging God on 50, but I've been there. There's probably not 50 people. Per adventure, there shall lack 55 of the 50 righteous. So now he's down to 45. Would you destroy it for the city for the lack of, of five? And he said... If I find there 45, God said, I won't destroy it. And he spake unto him again. And Abraham keeps going with this thing here. This is how good a friend he is with God. And let me tell you something. Some of you don't know how to pray. You pray to God, talk to God. Like jostle with him a little bit. Now, don't get too disrespectful. Uh, but, but, you know, you can talk to him and say, Lord, I really do want my tuition paid. You said in your word, claim his promises. Remind him of them. He can't lie. If there are 40 found there, and he said, I would not do it for 40's sake. Verse 30, and he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there be 30. He jumped 10 now. And he said, I will not do it for 30. He said, oh, wait a minute. You know, Abraham's like, wait a minute. I, you know, when I was there, Dak, I don't think I saw 30 people. What if there are 20? God said, if there's 20, I won't destroy it. Verse 32, and he, said, and, and he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this one. Another Abraham's okay. I'll give one more shot. What if you just find 10? 20% of what I said initially. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. You, know, does he what, you see what the Bible says? What was he doing with Abraham? Yeah. Communing. Some of us have this idea that to, to, to be with God and to, to deal with God means that there's some huge separation. There is an awe and a respect we always have, but we can commune with God, talk to God as if we are talking to a friend. That's what prayer in essence is. And Abraham returned unto his place. It is one of the most incredible stories that if there were just 10 righteous people, it would never have happened. Now, if I had time tonight, I would show you the archaeological evidence from when I visited Israel of the fact that these cities once existed. There are some documentaries where people go, have gone under the pressure of the Dead Sea. It is very serious pressure. You, every, everything basically floats. And they've actually found structures under the Dead Sea that have 90 degree angles, which means somehow man must have been involved with their creation. They've, on, the, on the other side, I think on the um, Jordanian side of the Dead Sea, they found evidences of charred flesh. When I was there, they even showed us pictures. Thank you. Um, um, they showed us a, a mounds of the salt and what was fascinating is that when you look at um, uh, the study of organic chemistry, if you take organic material and you mix it with heat and sulfuric acid, which is what brimstone is, one of the byproducts from any organic uh, chemistry experiment you run is you're automatically going to produce salt. 
The fact that that sea is so full of salt, unique in all the planet, is God leaving evidence that this story is true. Let me tell you something. We don't believe what we believe based on just blind faith. We don't believe cunningly devised fables. The world itself gives evidence to what we believe. And if you are here and you struggle with what you believe, I want to submit to you that you don't have to hang your faith on nothing. God has left plenty of evidence. But it brings us to the point of the message. There are five times in the Bible when God spared not. How many times? Five times in the Bible when God spared not. I want to show you the first one. We just discussed it. And those were the cities of Lot. 2 Peter 2 and verse 6 says this. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And so why were these cities overthrown? Most people think they know, and they don't know why it was. They have no idea what actually happened. To find the answer to why these cities were destroyed, you do not look in the book of Genesis. You look in the book of Ezekiel. What book did I say? Ezekiel. Now watch this. Ezekiel 16, 49 gives you the key to what happened. And then when you see this, I want you to notice the parallel to society today. Ezekiel 16, 49 says, Behold, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. Here it is. Number one, pride. Number two, fullness of bread. Number three, abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Nine, look at number four. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Those are the four sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. There they are. Now here's what that causes. Verse 50 says, and they were haughty, meaning they were arrogant. And what did that lead to? Then the abomination came. The abomination is a byproduct of the first four sins. Oh, y'all missing this thing. The Bible says, and so therefore God says, I took them away as I saw good. The real problem is that pride especially rises up in folk and they begin to cast off the need or they think the need for the law of God. And you know what? We live in a time now where it's all about the individual. It's all about me. It's all about my group. And we're all very proud of who we are. And I can tell you, it is a dangerous time. Many Christians are walking away from the church because they are more concerned with their genetic identity, um, their certain behaviors that they do, all kinds of different things. They're more concerned what community they fit into than with being like Christ. And the world is drawing people away into social justice platforms and, and arguments around, uh, um, you know, about, around what now, a word I don't like, but I'll say it, wokeness. And people don't understand that this was literally what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. And we're back there now. But pride is what matters most. People, you know, I've never seen people take pictures of themselves so much. <laughs> I work at, I, you know, we run urgent care. People literally fall into manholes, um, fall off the sides of cliffs and stuff, taking pictures of themselves. <laughs> I mean, it's the most, it's the craziest thing ever. I, I mean, I, I was in a park once and kids were like syn synchronizing, jumping in the air and trying to take the picture at the same. <laughs> the vanity. And what do you do with all of these pictures anyway? <laughs> Back in the day, we had an album. I mean, once it was full, of basically it. Like, all right, our family album's done. Now you put it away. <laughs> but this pride is not healthy. The focus on self is not spiritually healthy. It is destructive. Here's what the Spirit of Prophecy says. In the Manuscripts 20, uh, 233, uh, 1902, it says, All pride in human agencies is a direct affront to God. Did you get that? I love this quote. All exaltation of self is displeasing to God. Men claim to themselves the honor of wisdom, which honor belongs wholly to God and came from God. Man originates nothing. God will abase all who rob him of his glory. And then she quotes, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better, look, I like this line, better is it to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil 
with the proud. So the first time God spared not was the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they were not spared because of the sin of pride. So number two, the second time in the Bible, and we go from the smallest jurisdiction to the largest. So we start with the cities. We jump to a nation. It was the nation of Israel. Romans chapter uh, 11 and verse 20 says, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off and thou standest by faith. Be not high minded, but fear. And look at what it says here. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Did you get that? We have been grafted in. And he says that the natural branches have been spared not. Now, this is, you know, I wish I had time because I'd break this down a little further, but I will say this. Literally, there is an obsession with literal Israel today. The idea that all, even our foreign policy as a nation is, is manifested around uh, inaccurate uh, um, understanding of the scripture. That's how deep the thing goes. Uh, well, some of our relatives, uh, when, when, when Donald Trump moved the, the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem that Christmas, they went to go help build the third temple. I'm not sure how much they got done on it, because I haven't seen the third temple just come, around, come out yet. But this is what they're trying to do. But it, it is a mistaken understanding of prophecy. Because the Bible says it here. It says in a lot of Jesus says, I've given your kingdom to another. He left, uh, Matthew chapter 23, he comes out of the temple. He says, I leave your house unto you desolate. I could go on and on and on. There are plenty of places. But here's one that's very clear. He spared not the natural branches. And you know, there's a whole movement around black people. This whole, the whole um, controversy with Kanye West and, and then the movie that Kyrie Irving, just all Kyrie Irving did was tweet a picture of the movie. And... I think they moved him to like, I don't know where they sent the poor boy to go play basketball now. But um, it is all because these guys think that you have to have the genetic blood that traces all the way back to Abraham. And they think there's power in that. So there's a whole new movement called the Black Hebrew Israelite Movement. And I've had debates with them on the corners of Miami and New York and Los Angeles around the scripture. And I will leave, just, I will just say this to you. It is not physical, genetic relation that saves. It is spiritual. Amen. You see, Abraham is the father of the righteous, not because there was something special about his DNA, but there was something special about his believing. Amen. And if you believe like Abraham believed, even if you don't have a drop of his blood in you, you can be just as righteous because righteousness is by faith as he was. So they were cut off. But why were they cut off? Hosea 8.1, set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord. Because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law, I shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. Israel has cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. And some say this, one, of the, one, of the, um, one of the symbols for Rome was the eagle. So I've heard people say this, in fact, might even speak to when uh, uh, a Titus does what he does in AD 70. Hosea 8, 12, I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Look at verse 14. What did Israel do? She forgot her maker. Israel has forgotten his maker and builds temples, and Judah has multiplied fenced cities. But I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. Israel has forgotten his maker. And we have watched our society. So remember the first four from, from the city. The one for the nation is he forgot God. Let me tell you something. I, was, I, was, I went to Oakwood University, one of our Adventist schools, and I'm very, I'm very glad for it. I was a biology major, chemistry minor, and learned creation science alongside evolution. They taught us both so we could pass exams when we left. But they told us why we were, I mean, it was a very good, rigorous curriculum, taught me a lot, learned a lot. I remember I went to University of Alabama in Huntsville to take a comparative anatomy class um, just to kind of help prep me for the MCAT and to get a little bit of a different feel and, and, and for some other reasons. And while I was over there, I took that class and the professor who came out, and this is in the deep south in Alabama, 
He comes out in overalls, and I, I, I tell you, he actually looked like Charles Darwin. It was the strangest thing. It was a beard, everything. And he comes out, and this man did not teach our class. He preached it. With the cadence of a preacher, he taught the theory of evolution. He was so convincing that in a class where most of my classmates were probably Southern Baptists or Methodists, by the end of the semester, most of them had given up their belief in God. Israel has forgotten his maker. You know, one of the, you know, the other reason, you know, we have the, the First Amendment, but there are other words in our Constitution, Declaration of Independence and Bill of Rights. One of the best is the words that say, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Isn't it ironic? They would want to do away with the creation when, in fact, if you remove creation, there is literally no reason for equality, equity, or justice. I want you to think about that for a second. If you remove the fact that we were all created equal, then really the, 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 you know, the, it's just the survival of the fittest. So if your group can overpower another group, that's just the way it should be. But the reason the civil rights movement was successful was because Christians stood up and said, Martin Luther King Jr. actually said it, we are holding a blank check in how it was written. If you do away with God in a society, you do away with actual equality. I want you to remember that. Because once you do that, now, if you do not believe and agree with what I'm saying, I can wipe you out and still say we're equal. Here's what the Bible, uh, Spirit of Prophecy says. The apostasy of Israel developed gradually. From generation to generation, Satan had made re repeated attempts to cause the chosen nation to forget the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments that they had promised to keep forever, Deuteronomy 6.1. He knew that if he could only lead Israel to forget God and to walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, they would surely perish. Did you get that? The enemy knew that if you just lead people away from God, they, will, they would perish. He, he knew that's all he had to do. So the first time... It was the cities. Pride led them to sin. The second time, it was the nation of Israel. It was spared not because they broke the covenant and they forgot God. And let me tell you something. This is literally the religion of our public school systems is evolution, secularism. And it is very dangerous. And I, I say this in other messages. I, I won't get into it tonight, but I'll say this. If you remove God, you remove purpose. And if you remove purpose, then pleasure becomes the highest order for humanity. Think about it for a second. There's no purpose. There's, I mean, there's no, we're all just going to live, die, and it's a cosmic thing. And there's, you know, then all that matters is while I'm alive, I should get as high as I can, live as wild as I can. And that trap is destroying many because a lot of the anxiety, the depression, a lot of the mental health issues I see in practice actually come from the fact that kids are coming in and they have no sense of purpose or value based on anything outside of themselves. Meaning they have no idea how much God loves them. The third thing, third time when God spared not, it was the old world, the world before the flood. Second Peter 2, 5 says this, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And here's the story. Genesis 6, 11, the earth was also corrupt before God. The earth was filled with what? Violence. God looked at the, upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. What was it that God didn't like? Violence. Now, you notice, every one of these things I'm, I'm telling you are prominent in society. In fact, we see mass shootings now in America so often, many of us, within an hour, don't even consider it anymore. I want you to think about it for a second. Someone could go in and shoot up. We just preach. There's a, you know there's an Adventist church on Michigan State University campus. And that, that church has um, a campus ministries. They outreach to the students. And right there, we, we were just there preaching last year. Right there. And if someone goes on the campus and kills three students and injures five more. The week before, there was another shooting. And it gets to the point where you literally happen so fast. And in so many different parts of the country, we don't even think about it anymore. The war in Europe, the violence, the stories that we're getting back from there. 
And I could go on and on, and it's not just Europe, it's not just America. The planet is engulfed with, with stories and tales of hideous crimes, and it is on the rise. I have, sto- I have some, some, some message I do on prophecy, and I can actually show you from the data, uh, epidemiologically, the increase in these violent acts. Here's what the spirit of prophecy says. The inhabitants of the Noetian world were destroyed because they were corrupted through the indulgence of perverted appetite. Signs of the Times, September 2nd, 1875. They worshiped self-indulgence, eating, drinking, merrymaking, and resorted to acts of violence and crime if their desires and passions were interfered with. This is what's happening in the world today. So, first three, the cities, it was pride that led to sin. The second, um, it was the covenant was broken and they forgot God. The third, it was a corrupted appetite and violence. The fourth time that God spared not, dealt with the universe. The first time was the city, second time was the nation, the third time was the planet. This one is the universe. Second Peter 2, 4, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. The angels that sinned were not spared. A third of them. Look at here, uh, Revelation 12, 7 through 9 says it like this. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Did you get that? They were cast out. And at the cross, when Jesus died on the cross, they were sealed. They could never go back again. Spirit of Prophecy says this. Like the angels, the dwellers in Eden had been placed upon probation. Their happy estate could be retained only on condition of fidelity to the Creator's law. They could obey and live or disobey and perish. God had made them the recipients of rich blessings. But should they disregard His will, here it is, He who spared not the angels that sinned, could not spare them. Transgression would forfeit his gifts and bring upon them misery and ruin. And what was the real battle over in heaven? God's character. And let me tell you, you know what the world has done? It has introduced in the pulpits of this world concepts like an eternal burning hell so that you you have a weird view of God's character. Because if if you only live 30 years and you do 30 years worth of dirt, you're going to burn forever? I mean, it starts to look like cruel and, uh, and unjust. And so people begin to withdraw. The character of God is on trial. And I'll talk a bit about this tomorrow in the, with the Marvel Universe and the Marvel movies, how they are literally beginning to, to, um, to brainwash kids into believing that God is tyrannical. God is represented in these movies as Thanos. And so... They are trying to do, this was the war. This is what so the, the angels in heaven under Lucifer's power, they believed God was not fair. His character was not right. His law was not keepable. And that's what the attack was on. And let me tell you something. It is happening now again. So the first four times, pride, forgot God, violence, and attacking God's character. And you know, as I prepare the sermon and I look at it, I think to myself, if God didn't spare Sodom, and I'm a sinner, why would he spare me? How much trouble am I in if, like Israel, there are times in my life when I forget God? How much trouble am I in if there are times when my appetite is out of control or I am violent or unkind? Or if by my life, calling myself a Christian, but not behaving like Christ, I actually injure the way people would see the character of God. And as you start to look at it, you start to worry, Lord, is there any hope for me? Is there any way that I could be saved? And the devil starts to ruminate in your mind all your life's failures, and you begin to wonder, will I, can I be forgiven of God? But church, there's one more time that God spared not. Romans 8, verse 32 says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Ah, this is where the story gets beautiful. 
You see, he didn't spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He did not spare the nation of Israel. He did not spare the antediluvian world. He didn't spare the angels that sinned. But in order that you and I might be saved, God did not spare his son. This, my friends, is the very crux of Christianity. That there was an exchange made. Jesus died the death I deserve so I could live the life he deserves. Being a Christian means that there's a swap, and this is why I begin with Abraham looking up at the stars and being credited with righteousness because uh, you are justified as you believe in him. Satan wants you to believe you've done too much wrong to be accepted by God, but I was sent here tonight to tell you you have not out God's ability to save you. He spared not his own son. Here's what the spirit of prophecy says. Without the cross, man could have no connection with the father. Mm. On it hangs our every hope. In view of it, the Christian may advance with the steps of a conqueror. For from it streams the light of the Savior's love. When the sinner reaches the cross and looks up to the one who died to save him, he may rejoice with fullness of joy for his sins are what? They're pardoned. That ought to liberate somebody tonight. You see, the devil's going to want to constantly remind you of all the things you've done wrong. The devil's going to constantly try and make you think you're too much of a failure to be saved. I want you to understand uh, that when the devil reminds you of your past, you ought to remind him of his future. <laughs> Kneeling at the cross, he has reached the highest place to which man can attain. See, when I was, when I was at that job, the, the part of the testimony that's most important isn't the fact that I was delivered by First Liberty as great as it was and the battle we fought over religious liberty and winning it was awesome. You know what was most important? That God humbled me. That my aspirations to do more and be more and to climb, uh, in the, not the corporate ladder, but the public health ladder of this world. What was most important is that God allowed me to go through something that humbled me and removed from off of my character those things that would have attached me to earth and made, it, made me unable to fly when he returned. You see, that's why the highest place you can reach in this world is kneeling at the cross. Amen. Not the president's office. I, I worked in Washington, D.C. I was on committees at the Centers for Disease Control. I was on the President's Advisory Council for HIV and AIDS, uh, committees for the government of California, I, all kinds of good stuff. Spoke at all the conferences uh, for the Bush administration, did all kinds of stuff. And I can tell you, it means nothing. I've got a house full of awards and stuff I got from elected officials. It is sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. You know what matters to me? What matters to me is that I carry the reward of the blood of Jesus Christ. That blood-stained banner, that's what matters to me. When I get to glory, nobody's going to care how many degrees I have. And if I don't get to glory, it still won't matter how many degrees I have. Me and my degrees are going to be burning right next to each other. Kneeling at the cross, he has reached the highest place to which man can attain. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. And the words of pardon are spoken. Live, O ye guilty sinners. Live. Your repentance is accepted, for I have found a ransom. Jesus is the ransom that was found. Through the cross, we learn that our heavenly father loves us with an infinite and everlasting love and draws us to him with more than a mother's yearning sympathy for a wayward child. Can we wonder that Paul exclaimed, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I glory in nothing else. No accomplishments. No matter what I've done, it, it pales in comparison to the cross. Our only hope is perfect trust in the blood of him who can save to the uttermost all that come unto God by him. The death of Christ on the cross of Calvary is our only hope in this world. Not the Republican nominee, not the Democratic nominee. You can vote whoever you want to vote, but there's no hope in that. They can't fix the world. They can't even make sure they turn over documents and stuff. 
I mean, who quits a job and takes the work home with them? You know what I mean? Leaves a job. The death of Christ on the cross of Calvary is our only hope in this world. And look at this, and will be our theme in the world to come. Oh, we do not comprehend the value of the atonement. If we did, we would talk more about it. The gift of God and his beloved son was the expression of an incomprehensible love. It was the utmost that God could do to preserve the honor of his law and still save the transgressor. Did you get that? So all the four times that he spared not, the standard remains. But the only way that the standard could remain and we be pardoned is that Christ had to die. He had to be a divine. A, 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 it was the death of one who was divine to pay the ransom and set us all free. Why should man not study the theme of redemption? It is the greatest subject that can engage the human mind. Isn't that powerful? If men would contemplate it, the love of Christ, if men would contemplate the love of Christ displayed in the cross, their faith would be strengthened to appropriate the merits of his shed blood, and they would be cleansed from, and saved from sin. In fact, Peter, who says all of that stuff about who, didn't, who, who wasn't spared, he says this, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want one soul to be lost. We were just doing a prayer meeting at our church. We were going through one of the parables in it where, where it actually says, if only one sinner, uh, one uh, person had sinned, Christ would have come to save that one person. You see, Christ was not spared so that you and I could be. Christ was not spared so that you and I could be. Before my wife sings, I want to tell you a, a, a story that was in part inspired by Weimar. A long time ago, Weimar had um, a place in, um, not Paris, California, it was in Nuevo, or it was a little house somebody gave Weimar, and they were, you guys were, none of y'all were probably even there when, here when, I, when this happened. You run a little, like, um, a rehab place down there in this house. And I would go and just do the physicals. So I used to work for Weimar. Nobody knows that <laughs> until just now. I've never said it publicly. And I never got paid either because I told them to keep the money. <laughs> I was in residency at Loma Linda at the time. And I was learning about addiction treatment at work because I was a preventive medicine resident. And I was also learning through this, the work that Weimar was doing at this little house that I think eventually they sold. And it was actually a big house that they sold. And I had a patient come in one day. So if you listen to my sermons, you've heard this before, so bear with me. He came in, the blonde hair, blue-eyed guy in his early 40s. I was working at the addiction treatment unit at, uh, unit at the Veterans Hospital. We had uh, Dr. Mickey Ask, and I forget the name of the addiction psychologist, psychiatrist that was there. And he, this guy comes in, and I was a resident, and he sits down in the chair in the office where I'm at. He looks at me, and he says, Doc, I want to die. I said, man, we just started. What do you mean you want to die? He did not crack a smile. He didn't, you know, I was trying to get a, be lighthearted with him. He said, no, I, I'm serious. I want to die. I said, if you want to die, what are you doing here? He said, I figured it was more likely I would die here than somewhere else. I said, oh, that's terrible because I work here. <laughs> and so I said, what do you mean? He said, you see, I was driving down the I-10 freeway going towards Palm Springs. And I was high as a kite on crystal meth and alcohol. And I was swerving on the highway so hard that the police pulled me over, the California Highway Patrol. And when they pulled me over, they realized I was drunk and high. So they searched my vehicle. He said, and when they searched my vehicle, they found in my trunk all the equipment to create a crystal meth lab. He said, and so I, it went from just a driving under the influence uh, driving while intoxicated, it went from that to um, intention to manufacture and distribute um, um, drugs. I don't know what the technical term is. I'm not a lawyer. And I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, and in my mind, I'm thinking, what is he doing sitting here? Shouldn't he be in prison? <laughs> I said, that's why I said, yeah. I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, I went to the judge for the initial trial. And this man was a veteran of the Vietnam War. It served our country. 
And he came back and, and, you know, in the process of the trauma of the war and other things that happened in his life, he was an addict. He got to the judge, and the judge was also a veteran, fortunate for this man, and it was God's providence. And the judge said, listen, since you served your country, I'm going to give you two options. You can either go to prison for a very long time on these charges, or I'll send you to the veteran's hospital so that you can be rehabilitated. The man said... He looked at me and he said, I chose to come here because I figured it's easier to die here than in prison. I said, that is a terrible thing to say. And, I, and in that moment, I, was, I want the students, especially those that are pre-med students and nursing students to hear this, I didn't know what to say. And so I actually sat there with, looking at him and called on the name of the Lord. I said, Jesus, what do I say to this man? And What came out of my mouth was this. Do you know the Lord Jesus? Didn't know what to expect him to say. You know what the man answered? He said, looked at me and he said, he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And I said, if you know that answer, why do you want to die? He said, because I've done too much wrong for Jesus to ever accept me. It was as if the man was It was all of his past was just percolating in him. And he began to verbally just vomit it all out. He began to tell me from his childhood all the ways that he had been corrupted and abused and and violated and all the times when he uh, early uh, exposure to drugs and alcohol. He told me about his marriage that failed and how half his check while he was in Vietnam was going to this woman while she was messing with one of his friends and he he went through all of the sin, all of the dirt he'd ever done. And when he was finished, as if he was exhausted from expressing all of this. He looked at me hoping I would agree with him that he had done too much wrong for Jesus to accept him. And he looked at me and finished it as as, as if to say, I rest my case. And I looked at him and I said, sir, God set this appointment. And I took a government issue, before we were using EMRs like we do now, I took a government issued um, uh, um, progress note paper. I didn't have any glow tracks on me. And I began to write out the plan of salvation. I literally started in Revelation chapter 12 with the war in heaven. I explained to him that God's character was on trial. We went to the Garden of Eden. I spoke about how, how the, our, 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 par- our, our first parents sinned in the garden. And I explained to him um, what that did to earth. I explained to him Genesis 3, 15, and jumped all the way to the birth of Christ. And when we got to the birth of Christ, I talked about Bethlehem and how even the devil, when he saw Jesus in the manger, couldn't believe that one who once sat so high would come so low. I talked about his sinless life in a rough place like Nazareth, and and I talked about how he went to the cross and died. And I explained to him it was an ignoble, shameful death, uh, one that caused even his own disciples to run from him. And as the man sat there, I looked at him and I said, what I want you to get from all of this is this. If you had been the only sinner on earth, Christ would have died for you. Tears began to run down his face. He dropped his head, picked it back up, and he looked at me. He said, you, Doc, you mean Jesus would have died just for me? I said, absolutely he would have. He began to sob and cry as, it, as that truth began to in his bones and reverberate throughout his mind. He began to weep and sob and he fell to the ground crying, do you really mean that he would have saved just me? I said, sir, I've got proof that he would have saved just you. I said, sir, he died and saved a wretch like me. I said, I am the evidence that the blood of Jesus Christ still washes and that it still cleanses. And he and I wept on the floor of the veterans hospital as he gave his life to Jesus Christ right there on the floor of the hospital. When we were done praying and he gave his life to him, he left and I was in the hallway doing rounds the next week, uh, um, uh, about a week later, and he saw me from way down the hall, those long hallways in that veterans hospital, and he came running down the hallway, brother doctor, brother doctor. (laughs) 
And he threw his arms around me. And he said, brother doctor, since you prayed for me, since we had our time together last week, he said, I no longer even have a desire for alcohol or drugs. I said, praise the Lord. I said, how is everything else going? Because now you got to put your life back together. He said, I have only one problem, doc. I said, what's that? He said, they keep kicking me out of the Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous meetings. I said, why would they do that? He said, because I'm, they tell me I am calling on the name of Jesus too much in the meetings. <laughs> I saw that man years later when I was moonlighting in the emergency room of that same veterans hospital, still a Bible-believing Christian. God spared not his son. Melvi Broadcasting Network, a divine voice out of Africa. Remember to like, to subscribe, and to click the bell.